Thanks for tuning in, and without further ado, I want to welcome Joe Strauss, the Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives. Thank you. Good to be with you, Jim. Well, it's really great to have you. So I want to start just by asking you very directly, uh, as we go into the session, in the last session, it seemed like the leadership was all very much on the same page in terms of what we heard at the beginning of the 2013 session. It seems a little bit less so, but I want to ask you, what's, what's on your agenda? What do you think is important for Texas in this legislative session? Well, for me, the agenda doesn't really change a whole lot from session to session. And I don't think it has in the Texas House either. Um, we have a whole group of new leaders in statewide office, which provides a, a fresh opportunity for new ideas. Uh, but in the Texas House, I think we've stayed true to our fundamental interest in um, helping our economy continue to grow, um, paying attention to the nuts and bolts issues that that really um, are important to future generations of Texans, and that start the list with public education, um, higher education, strengthening our universities and colleges. Um, I think you have to take a step back and look at all the accomplishments of the last session in terms of addressing our natural resources, our water needs, and finding after decades of inaction a, a, um, a, a true uh, funding solution there. Um, making some good progress in transportation where we still have work to do. Um, so really, um, really focusing on those things that matter to a state that's 27 million people and continuing to grow uh, at a rate that's twice as fast as the rest of the country. Okay, so you mentioned education and that is one of the perennials. So where do you think, where do you think we are in moving forward on education? Chairman Acock has put forth I think a, a bill that surprised some folks, frankly, and he described it as something he wasn't even sure he agreed with, I think. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> a great way to start. But. <laughs> Nonetheless, it was a, a, an ambitious plan in terms of thinking about a fundamental appro a restructuring approach to how we fund public education that maybe even would put us ahead of where the courts are right now, given that uh, the system is in the courts again. How, what's your sense of that? Is that? Well, my sense of it is that Chairman Acock is comfortable enough and confident enough uh, in the subject area that he's willing to put something out there that even he may not say, this is my way and I hope I'm expecting all of you to follow. Um, I think he's been very open and transparent in his um, approach to improving public education on the finance side in particular this interim. He's brought a whole number of um, members into the conversation in an informal way, uh, bringing them up to speed on finance issues. Um, not coming up or promising a grand solution, but talking about possibilities. Uh, what was I found sort of amusing um, and not really all that um, surprising is that they would come up with a number of ideas and solutions. They'd throw them up against the wall and he found out that not any of them really worked. <laughs> um, but, but it shows that he has confidence and it shows that he is a master of the subject and he's not afraid to throw some subjects out there that may not may not ultimately um, become a law, um, but the first step in, I think, developing a good law is being open-minded um, and maybe even a little bit unpredictable, which isn't a bad thing, and I think that's a pretty good way to describe the Texas House at times. Well, and he certainly demonstrated that, I think, given the surprise with which that was greeted. I mean, do you, do you think that there's, do you have the sense that the conversation will keep going during the session and that there's a chance that the legislature might in fact be in front of the courts for once? Well, I think that's a possibility. I think it's a real good possibility. Um, it certainly isn't going to be an issue, obviously it's not going to be an issue that'll be swept under the rug or ignored. Um, we've already made great progress in, in beginning the discussion. Where we end up, I don't know. Um, but if we, can, if we can make some progress, that'd be a whole lot better than, than you know, biting our fingernails and hoping that something bad doesn't happen to us. Do you think so I, that, I think, I think, and I think generally the Texas House is, feels very um, strongly about wanting to support public education. Um, doesn't mean a blank check. It doesn't mean, you know, rolling over and taking it from any particular <coughs> faction or organization. But it does mean we want our public schools to be better, and um, we're committed to that. And I think we'll work through and come up with some some good ideas and and um, accomplish a lot in public education this session. And we did last session too. I mean, I think it's instructive to go back and look again at the advancements we made and the reforms we passed in the last session in terms of 
um, cutting back on the, on the testing, over testing in our high schools. Um, and that was a big accomplishment. House Bill 5 was a very big law. And um, it, it was meant to address um, opportunities for our young people in this state in terms of workforce development, in terms of um, giving more local control over curriculum, um, giving young people an opportunity to pursue their interests, um, those who are going to college and those who are not going into higher education, but to prepare them better in areas of their interests uh, with the goal that they be um, more employable and that they be able to our young people be um, more um, be more ready for the workforce that has had, fortunately, a lot of opportunity in recent years. And Chairman Aycock has said there's probably a little bit of fine tuning on some of those that he expects to do during the session. So yeah, I'm sure we'll that's, that was a big that was a big it was really big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I can't help but hear, and maybe I'm reading I could well be reading too much into this, but I felt like there were little underlines under public education in the way that you were describing that. In the other chamber, one of the major public education focus seems to be on, I'll call them vouchers because none of them are here to correct me, but <laughs> some sort of a system of vouchers or scholarships or tax credits in which uh, parents would be able to send students to private institutions. Now, the House has traditionally been where those bills have gone to die. Uh, do you see much change in that? Well, the, the, our new lieutenant governor has made no secret of his passion for this, for this issue. Um, I suspect he'll work very hard to get legislation passed in the Senate um, in this regard. As far as the House is concerned, the very public uh, display early in the last session uh, via an amendment, not a bill, was an expression against um, this type of approach. And if my memory is correct, it was over 100 members that voted no. Um, so there may have been a shift in attitude there. Could well be. And um, I think even Chairman Aycock has said he's not afraid to have the discussion. Um, again, confidence in the subject matter. Details matter. And I think generally speaking, the House is a place where we will legislate seriously. And uh, we're going to vet every serious bill that comes through. And thoroughly take a look at the details um, and not say, not say no uh, to anything on the, on the front end until we, until we have a chance to chew on it, talk about it, think about it. And the devil has generally been in the details on those voucher bills in the past. In the well, that's the, that's the way the House has seen it yeah. uh, in the past, and I, I don't have any indication that there's been a major shift away from that. Um, but, you know, I don't, as, as Chairman Aycock said, there's no, no harm in talking about it. Uh, for, uh, somebody I know that works in the, on the advocacy side for the private school said that Chairman Aycock had gone from over my dead body to maybe I'll hear about it. <laughs> so Hey, well. <laughs> that's progress for them. I guess it would be, yeah. Um, one, one last beat in, in public education, uh, K through 12, which we could talk about in another area, but I kind of want to ask you about it right away, and that is in-state tuition for children of undocumented uh, parents, Texas Dream Act. Um, that's another issue that uh, has a lot of sort of backers, uh, the repeal of the, of the bill or the modification has a lot of backers in the Senate. You see much traction on that in the House? Well, I haven't really asked. Um, if you want to know my personal view, it's um, very much aligned with, with Rick Perry um, when he said that he would rather see um, a generation of givers than takers. And, um, you know, these are young people. I'm not, not sure how many really are in our schools under this arrangement, um, in our colleges and universities. I would imagine it's a relatively low number. Um, but these are young people who have played by the rules, who have qualified for admission in our colleges, who have gone to our public schools. And uh, personally, I can think of a lot worse things these people can be doing with their lives uh, than pursuing higher education and becoming engaged citizens in our economy and paying taxes. So my personal view is pretty clear on it. Um, I haven't asked the House members how they feel. How tough do you, do you find the politics of that, given that on one hand, I think there's a, you're, the view you just expressed personally is very common, I think, among what I would think of as Republican leadership, certainly among the business community in Texas. There was a big rally today 
uh, Texas Association of Business, in support of the Dreamers, Texas Association of Business had a presence, for example. And yet when we poll kind of Republican voters, there's much less support and in fact majority opposition. I mean, is there a, a conversation that needs to happen about that? You just have to try well, to yeah, avoid sure. it. Well, yeah, sure. There, there needs that? to be a conversation about anything that's a big shift away from current policy that's important. It's important to our economy, important to young people in this state. You can't just, you can't just legislate based on campaign slogans or headlines. Uh, get into the details, see what it really means, bring people along, educate them about what this change in policy would mean to people's lives, what it would mean to people's businesses, what it means to people's futures as Texans, and what signal it sends to other states around the country about what Texas is and how we treat our young people, uh, and what kind of opportunities people will have here, whether you were brought here by parents uh, from another country illegally, um, or whether you were born and raised here. Texas is a place of opportunity, and I personally don't want to be a uh, party to anything that sets us back. Before we leave uh, education, I want to ask you a couple of higher ed questions, which of course, where we are, I better. Yeah. Um, where are we? <laughs> there's a, yeah, it's, it's hot enough, you may not know. Um, uh, tuition re-regulation or the issue of tuition in Texas. Um, I think to some degree, surprisingly, there's been a little bit of a, of a conversation about re-regulating tuition, quote unquote. Do um, you think there's much will that, to do that in the House? Well, there's certainly a concern about rising cost of higher education, a legitimate concern. Um, my personal view, again, not speaking for all the House members, but for me uh, specifically, deregulating tuition at a time when the state was not making a major investment in higher education made a lot of sense. And um, if you just look at the higher education marketplace, I'm not aware um, that there is a huge drop off in demand for higher education. Um, I haven't noticed it. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't some efficiencies that should be gained, some, some cost control measures that ought to be considered um, always. And, um, but along with that, I think is an obligation on the part of the state to show um, an interest in, and, um, and an investment in higher education, including being more focused on research in higher education. And getting back on a more positive uh, conversation in that area, I think, would be, would be very helpful and beneficial to our state and, and in terms of building our, um, our universities and colleges and trying to increase uh, the number of tier one institutions. Get back on that. Uh, productive conversation, which I think Governor Abbott is very interested in. I'm very happy to see his views, and, and uh, he is beginning to kind of flesh out that, that agenda as well. So you thought his re reorientation of some of like the Emerging Technology Fund was a good idea, for example? I think there's a lot to work with in what I understand his, uh, his approach to be, and I think the legislature is going to be very receptive to some of those ideas. Um, also in the, in the uh, realm of higher education, uh, guns on campus. Very sensitive topic here on campus. Um, a bill passed the House last time. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a lot of ways going into this, people that, are hand that handicap these things expect that a bill for guns on campus stands a pretty good chance again. What's your read of that situation? Do you think anything has changed? Chancellor McRaven, uh, has been pretty pronounced about this. Um, others in the higher ed community, once again, generally pretty opposed to this. Do you think anything's changed since last time? I don't know, I don't know if anything's changed. Um, but again, we're going to have a thorough vetting of the bills that are filed and have the conversation. I think it'd be important to listen to those in law enforcement, um, those who are entrusted to keeping um, our people safe on our campuses. Listen to that side of the argument. Listen to the, to the advocates, too, and uh, see if there isn't a policy that can be approved uh, and work its way through. Personally, I would uh, caution anyone to um, ignore uh, Admiral McRaven when you're talking about arms and ammunition. <laughs> I think that's a, that's, a, that's a broad sense, and I think he's, he's making the most of that sense. Um, you also mentioned transportation then is one of the move on is one of the you know one of the perennial one of the perennial subjects to some degree at least in the last few sessions but also something that carried over from last session i think after last session i think there was a sense that 
you know, we, uh, it's a bad metaphor, but we got water done and then kind of ran out of gas on transportation a little bit. <laughs> you think that's fair? I mean, is that kind of unfinished? You get the sense it's unfinished business going into this session? Little, uh, uh, to some extent, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it would be unfair to say we didn't do much on transportation in the last session. In the same session, we were making major reforms in education, made historic um, legislation and funding of our state water plan. We didn't ignore transportation. We, we increased funding um, within our budget for, for transportation, plus, and it was, took admittedly several special sessions, but we also passed what became Proposition 1 on the ballot, um, and we're going to be, as a result of its overwhelming pas passage, uh, going to be seeing um, well over a billion dollars. It fluctuates with the price of oil. Um, that didn't work out as well as one might have hoped. No, and people were warned of that. That came out in the debate. Uh, not, to, not to be too reliant on the high number there. Right. But it still should be you know, well over a billion dollars in the first year, which isn't nothing. Um, it's not new revenue, by the way, but it is money that will be going to transportation. So that was you know, fairly significant progress. And, and yeah, I think it's good to have, um, I think it's good to have this, this focus on transportation. It's absolutely critical um, to you know, particularly the urban areas of this state, but rural too, and, and the oil and gas producing areas have had their challenges um, and needs in transportation infrastructure. So I think it's good to have our eyes focused on transportation solutions. What I hope we will avoid, and I kind of sense we're getting into this trap a little bit, is that every session there seems to be something that needs to be solved, and legislators find it pretty, pretty difficult to say we're gonna spend money on something. So what, they, so what we've done um, and settled on is this approach that I've called the California style of governing. Let's send it to the voters and have them tell us to spend money on something. Um, I think it's time to get back to a more um, meat and potatoes appropriations approach. If transportation needs more money spent on it, the appropriators ought to put it in the budget and the, and the legislators ought to vote to do it. Well, so that brings me that you talked about, you emphasized that there was no new money you know, in, the, in the first, uh, in the measure that was passed last session. So yeah, it seems I, to me that- I, I inart, inartfully called it moving money from one pocket to another. Right, fair enough. But there's kind of a discussion of doing that again to some degree in term, this time in terms of targeting the state, the state motor vehicle tax, the fuel tax, the vehicle sales tax, and trying to you know, recalibrate how that money is directed. Is that the approach you're, you're talking about? I mean, yeah, is that the way the to do it? That's the approach I'm talking about, and I'm yeah. not predicting that that's not what we will settle on. But I would urge our appropriators and all legislators to focus on transportation funding without that kind of gimmick without that kind of redirecting of money that already exists. Say there's a need for transportation funding and vote to appropriate the money. Or say, you know, it's not that important. Which nobody seems to really want to be well, nobody want to say. No, they don't want to say it. They want the voters to tell us that's what they want us to do. <laughs> okay, so let's, there's another piece to that puzzle then, which is also on the agenda, and I think you mentioned it in your, in your opening day speech or early on, and that is tax relief. The focus of tax relief seems to me right at this point to be in two areas property tax relief, the margins tax. Um, it seems like a lot of people have made close to promises about property tax relief. Think that's gonna happen? If it is, what do you think the, the form that will be that that takes? Yeah, there's been a lot of promises made. <laughs> I've made some myself. I guess you could say that ending the diversion of the gas tax was a promise. I've been pretty strong on that um, for a long time. But there have been others who say, we're gonna, we're gonna eliminate the margins tax. We're gonna, we're gonna spend $5 billion more on transportation. We're gonna um, cut uh, property taxes. We're gonna double spending on border security after we've just tripled it in three sessions. Um, my concern is that we pass a budget, a budget that balances, that addresses our key priorities, and that adds up. And uh, I think that's gonna be a big challenge and keeping all these promises that people have made. So that brings us then to the question of the budget. The House came in. Oh, can I, one, one more thing. Yeah, sure, I, please. You know, the goal in the House, and I'm very confident we'll get there, is to pass a budget that balances, that adds up, uh, that does provide some tax relief, 
and that, and that also does provide um, something that, that hasn't been discussed here yet, and that's some debt relief. There's a serious discussion about reducing debt in this state, too, which I think is, is timely. Okay, so let's go back then. I talked to you about, about your priorities. Physically, where do you see the sweet spot for, do, for producing that kind of budget? Well, that's really why we have a very large and diverse appropriations committee <laughs> who just started their meetings yesterday, so I'm not going to get ahead of their work, but I think they... I think they're, they're good. Um, Chairman Otto is going to do a great job there. He's a very, very smart guy, and, um, and there's some good people on that committee. So I'm not going to direct how the budget is put together, but in, in broad terms, I think one that addresses our key priorities in education and transportation and, uh, and also provides some tax relief, however they can find it and make it work, is good, um, and also address some, some debt, debt relief there, too. You, 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 you made sure you mentioned debt relief. Tell me a little bit about why you think that's important and why you well, think now is a good opportunity for that. Because we've relied um, on debt too much um, in recent years, particularly for transportation, but not just transportation. Um, again, a, 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 a get out of town plan without appropriating money. And, and in certain, in certain um, sessions, there has been a huge shortfall of money. I, believe me, I've been there and I know. You were there in 2009 yeah. and 11. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, I'm, you know, if, I, if, if I'm being critical, I'm being critical of myself, too. Um, but because we've relied on debt too much, um, I think it's time to go back and examine where we are um, and find in the intelligent way to reduce debt. We're in a low interest rate environment right now, and it may not make sense to you know, get rid of all of it. I'm not suggesting that. But I do think we ought to have a, a real serious look at the debt we have accrued in recent years and see if there's a, a smart way to start whittling away on that. You mentioned border security and when we were talking about expenditures, and it's been a pretty, you'll let me characterize it, there's been a pretty hot 24 hours in border security to my mind. Um, <laughs> You know, you had the lieutenant governor with it seems to me, I think everybody in the Republican caucus in the Senate uh, calling for, you know, more expenditures to keep the National Guard at the border through August. And, you know, not to overcharacterize, but I thought your office responded with a fairly pithy and direct response that seemed, you know, what the kids might say, kind of cool your jets. Um, well, that what, was your what was your response to that? I mean, and what, what was, why, why that reaction? Well, first, that wasn't my office. That was me. <laughs> okay. And I didn't mean it to be pithy, but I did, I think, just state an obvious fact. And that regardless of, you know, how many people show up at a press conference about uh, deployment of the National Guard, we only have one governor at a time. Our governor is Greg Abbott. He is the commander and chief of our state guard. And I was just repeating what is obvious. The commander in chief will make that decision. And when he does, the house will be ready to, to work with him to implement it. So you're not, you, you wouldn't necessarily, you're not rejecting out of hand oh, no. national guard deployment. No, not at all. We've worked with Governor Perry to, on the deployment last summer. Um, but I also think you should take a look at the um, testimony this morning in the House Appropriations Committee where General Nichols was talking about long-term continued deployment of the Guard and uh, the implications of that on his personnel and the cost effectiveness of it. Um, uh, Chairman Bonin spent a lot of the summer uh, and fall working on what we had created um, a select committee of mostly appropriators to take a look at the, at the efficiencies of the money that we have, again, tripled our spending on border security in the last three sessions. What are we getting for that? How effective is it? How do you measure it? Uh, before you go doubling it again, I think we ought to know what the metrics are and um, what the smart way to approach what is obviously and, and clearly a, a very you know, huge priority for the legislature. Everyone's for border security, but we need to be efficient, smart, and effective in how we implement these policies. Um, you know, it's a, federal, it's a federal responsibility that Texas has continued to step up on. And, um, you know, I hate to sound so frugal, but... Uh, Do you really? We can't, but we can't, but we can't, you know, we can't just keep tripling and doubling and, and, and going through this and be able to afford it. It's not sustainable. So we need help from the federal government, and we need a smart approach 
that is law enforcement driven in my view and not not so much um, you know the the optics of a military you know you you raise the optics of the military that that implies I think to some degree that politics is really driving some of these responses to border security which you know I would certainly understand given what we know about public opinion, particularly among Republican voters on border security. When we poll on border security, it's consistently the number one concern of Republican voters. Do you think that's maybe overtaken some of this technical assessment that you're talking about? Well, I've never met a Republican yet who didn't want efficient government. And so I think effective policy making, effective border security, uh, that makes sense is a whole lot more important than, than driving policy because of politics. And uh, I don't think the two should be, I don't think the two have to be separated. I think it's good politics to have efficient, good policy. And um, I think that's where we're gonna end up. It sounds to me a little bit like your comments, I feel like that's resonating with your comments a few moments ago about requiring some leadership in some of these circumstances. Well, we have a long session to go. We have 111 days to go. I mean, we're just now getting started. And I know in the Texas House, we have good, strong leadership who are detail-oriented, who are going to get in there and tear everything apart, ask a lot of good questions, and try to make the laws that we pass the best they can be for the state of Texas. Well, that's a moment to really where I want to I talk about politics. I do want to ask you about a couple more issues before we go, we go into that other, this other area. Um, it seems to me every session something comes up that is a little bit surprising, kind of comes either comes out of left field or, uh, you know, to beat ourselves up or that we miss in polling or whatever. It seemed to me last time offices were hearing about the reduction in the number of tests before we really picked it up in, in public opinion. And that became one of, frankly, the consensus points, probably one of the easier things you guys did during the session. Um, you see anything like that right now? What's, what's out there that you're not hearing a lot about in the media, say, but you're hearing about in the process? Anything striking you? I can't put my finger on a specific issue. Um, but going back to the over-testing in our high schools, mm -hmm. um, having Texas women and Texas mothers of school children speaking out forcefully was not... Um, was not um, was not something that we were going to miss. <laughs> um, pollsters, I'm going to leave, leave it up to you guys that sit in the dark and try to figure out how to reach these people. But anybody who knows Texas women and, and mothers of young children um, weren't confused by their priority. I feel like I should move my chair over into the black background. <laughs> um, uh, all right, I, I, let's, uh, another couple of issues then. How about vaccinations? Um, not, I'm not offering you vaccinations, yeah. but... I think I'm current. <laughs> as, a, as, an, as an issue, um, do you think that that's going to continue to, to be something that we, we hear I, about? I know that... I don't... That I just can't... I can't imagine... There's a bill that's I, been... Yeah, I don't... I don't... Um, I don't know where this vaccination business came from. I was thinking about it the other day, and what I... And I hope I'm wrong, but I'm afraid that it's... It's a symptom of the, of the lack of confidence that people have in our public institutions. Not just, we're going way beyond government leaders and you know, used car salesmen yeah. in, in terms of low... Uh, institutions. In, in, our, our in, the faith in our institutions is, is alarmingly low. And if this vaccination movement, whatever it is, is part of a lack of faith in our medical establishment, I think that warrants some serious discussion. And uh, I, I don't see the anti-vaccination thing going terribly far. Uh, but it is, a, it is a concern to me when you're talking about, you know, beyond just politicians that, you know, are free for um, shooting at, but when you're talking about our medical establishment and we've made such incredible gains in this country in eradicating deadly diseases over the last several decades, um, that to ignore that or to pretend that that's not important, I think is very alarming. Let's talk a little bit then about ethics and transparency legislation. Um, there have been a few things bubbling out there. Um, do you think that the problems at HHS with procurement make it inevitable that 
the legislature is going to get involved in doing something about that? Yes, we're going to get into that. And not just there, um, throughout government, we're going to take a real good look at contracting. Um, I don't want to point any fingers or get too far ahead of myself here, but we do have um, a general investigating committee um, that has some real power to it. And there are others that have jurisdiction over various agencies and departments too. Um, but we are going to get into contracting, and I think in a, very, in a very major way, and look at some very serious reforms. There's some that have already been um, proposed, but um, it's, a, it's a big issue, and it's a responsibility of oversight of the legislature, and it's one that we're going to take in the House very, very seriously, and, and um, don't know where we're going to end up specifically yet, but we will come up with something that helps tighten down on um, the abuses that I think we're very um, sad to be reading about. In the same area, do you, where do you think the Public Integrity Unit should be? Do you, do you think it should continue to exist? Well, the, the uh, base budget in the House continues to fund a Public Integrity Unit. Uh, where it's housed, what reforms need to be made there is a question that we're going to get into this session. Um, but to say that we're going to defund um, the ability to investigate corruption among public officials I think is not the message that the Texas House wants to send. How to, how to improve it, how to reform it, how to take some of the negatives out of it that we've been reading about in the last few years, I think we should do. Um, but we're not going to turn our backs on, um, on, on a public integrity unit operation of some kind. And that function needs to continue to exist in a realm of its own. Absolutely does, yes. Would you be comfortable with it in the Attorney General's office? Um, I believe that's a constitutional issue, and uh, I don't see that happening. Last but not least, issue-wise, uh, I want to talk about guns and open carry. We've talked a little bit about campus carry, but mm -hmm. um, you know the open carry debate has gotten very ugly in the very beginning portion of the session, and I think unexpectedly so to some degree. I mean, I don't know. Um, so, so where are you on these issues? Do, do you support con the, the so-called constitutional carry, unlicensed open carry? I don't think many House members support that. And um, I think some of these people that have been out there um, threatening members, um, calling it treasonous, punishable by death if you don't pass our bill, I don't care what the issue is. If the advocates come out threatening and bullying and making um, wild uh, threats like that, I would want to shut them down immediately. So you did take those as threats? I don't see how anybody who saw that video could take it as, in any other way. I think um, however the fellow was handled was let off pretty easy there. Um, how about permitted open carry, licensed open carry? Well, that's, a different, that's a different matter. And uh, again, I would just tell you that I, I, the House is a, is a place where there's strong pro-Second Amendment feelings. Uh, but again, details matter. And our committees are going to go through a thorough vetting of all the legislation that's proposed. And uh, I can't predict you know, what will pass. Um, but I, you know, it's a favorable place for gun legislation generally. Maybe not the real extreme one that that wild man's been out there talking about. But we're, um, you know, we're, we're more, more about results in this session than we are panic buttons. Um. Do you think that that discussion has aggravated some of the divisions that were in the House, or do you think it's brought people more together? It's an interesting, I mean, it's, it seems like it's obvious, the obvious answer is both, but you know, what do you, how do you judge the effect of the, some of the stuff you were just referring to on the mood in the House? Well, I think the House, the House has, has um, come together really nicely, and I think the last few sessions, we've tried to bring people together, we've reached across the aisle, in fact, there is no aisle in Texas House. Every member is encouraged to represent the district that they were elected from. And um, I think you see probably most bills have bipartisan um, uh, authorship. That's a good thing. Um, and I encourage people to work together. So I feel like the House is pretty united. And there are always going to be outliers. There will be different factions on different issues. That's just natural, and that's the way it should be. Um, but I think all in all, all, the House feels pretty good about the work we've done. 
And I think they're really anxious to do good work again the remaining days of the session. The day that you were reelected speaker, uh, you were reelected and, and you came out and you gave a short speech. The only, kind, only kind I give. And I was really struck by, and a lot of people appreciate that, yeah. I suspect. It's, you're not, you're one of the few, I think, that probably embraces that. But you did, you spoke very directly. I was really struck, honestly, by how directly you spoke. And you said a few phrases that, you know, a small number had sought to divide us with misleading and personal attacks. You said, the House belongs to no special interest, to no single interest. It belongs to almost 27 million Texas, and their scorecard is the only one that matters. Now, the people that follow these things, and, and listening to some of your comments today, frankly, you're being very direct, and not that you're been indirect in the past, but it feels to me like you're conveying an overall message right now that might be summed up as enough is enough in terms of some of the attacks that have taken place, in terms of some of the, the factional politics that have taken place inside the House especially, but also inside the party. Am I, am I wrong to read it that way? Well, I'm not a fan of attacks, no, <laughs> but, but I think more more of what I want to impart here is that the House is a place where we work together. <clears throat> now, that, that we're not embarrassed to say that. Um, and we produced really good results because we work together. And if that ru rubs some people raw, we want the Texas House to be more like Washington and you know, fight and do nothing and, and uh, you know, make headlines, well, they can try to do that, and some of them will. But I think the, the strong, vast majority of House members come here serious about the work they want to do. They want to do a good job for their, for their state. They want to do a good job for their constituents. And I think we built a culture of respect um, and cooperation where it's possible and uh, good outcomes. And I think we'll continue to see that in the, in the weeks ahead. So it sounds to me like you, know, you don't think that the, the underlying divisions that have sometimes risen are, are fundamental in nature. Are they more? Are they more personal? Is it something else? I mean, is there an ideological difference that's driving a, ma a minority, probably, in the House? Or is it ins versus outs? Or, you know, how do you, how do you parse that yeah. out when you see? Because some of those people are clearly dug in. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, I think you know. I know what you're talking about. Um, oh. But they keep losing. <laughs> they keep losing time and time again. And they don't learn their lesson. So my question that is, the, what is the, that about? The leadership in the Texas House has a way of getting things done. Invite everybody to participate. Buy in. Make your, make your um, proposal. I mean, Jimmy Don Acock at the beginning of this discussion was a great example of somebody who is open-minded. Bring your proposal, discuss it, vet it, go through all the details. And, um, <clears throat> and I, think, I think you'll find um, that that's a much better way of, of advancing a cause than saying, I'm gonna kill you if you don't do this. Yeah, that seems a little extreme. Yeah, I mean, they're not, get, they're not, not getting anywhere that way. Uh, yeah, I mean, it does seem like it was counterproductive. And, and you know, at least even in the narrow context of open carry, it took what I think. Yeah, or even, or even, or even you know, not to the extreme like that guy, but just, I mean, talking about I'm going to, you know, take you out in your primary or whatever. I mean, people, the Texas House members aren't going to be bullied. We can be persuaded, but with positive arguments, not with threats and threats of retaliation. It just, it's, it's, you know, work, work productively. We're not going to get everything done uh, that everybody wants. The system wasn't built for that. Do you, but, but I do think if you work within the system that we've created in the last few years, you can get a lot done by being positive and productive and um, working, working with other people. You feel like you've made that argument successfully and had, and persuaded people in the, la in the time that you've been speaker? I feel pretty good about the vast majority of members feeling good about themselves when they come to the House floor every morning. Doesn't guarantee results, and there's sure a lot of disappointed people after bills uh, pass or die. But I think overall, people feel pretty good about what we built there. It's kind of about how you accept loss, right? Yeah, it's politics. You're gonna lose I, don't, I don't get everything I want. You know, you've heard me talk about some things that, that, I, that the majority of the House may not ag agree with. But I'm not bent out of shape about it. You just go back to work and express your views and do the best you can, get what you can get. I want to ask you about one last 
area before we go to questions. Um, I started by talking. These weren't questions? <laughs> uh, questions from the audience. Um, when we started, I mentioned something uh, mm. about the degree of consensus we saw last time and of course, it, going into the session. And of course, the cast is very different right now mm -hmm. uh, because of the change in, in lieutenant governor and the governor. Um, also, on the day that you were elected speaker, you mentioned that the new guys had to buy breakfast. <laughs> Uh, are they buying breakfast, and are you guys having breakfast? Are you meeting regularly with the governor and the lieutenant governor? Tell us a little bit about what that, how, that relation, how those relationships are going. They say three-sided relationships are always inherently difficult. Uh, well, this one's a, a, even, even more complicated because um, my Comptroller Hager has been invited to join us. And yes, we have had several breakfast meetings. I had one today uh, at the governor's mansion where I think the governor and Mrs. Abbott um, and their daughter are, have this week, I think, moved into the residence. Um, I felt a little awkward. I didn't, I didn't bring a housewarming gift, but I will next time. Um, we are having our breakfast meetings, and um, you know they're productive. They're, they'll be more productive later in the session when there's actual legislation moving and being negotiated. But um, you know, it, it's, it's a good idea to sit down and talk to people that, you, that I may not see during the day or during the week otherwise. I mean, I stay pretty focused on work in the House, and I'm sure the Lieutenant Governor um, spends most of his time in the Senate, and the governor, you know, is doing what governors do. Um, and, and having Comptroller Hager join us, I think, um, has, been, has been interesting, too, and helpful. Whose idea was that? You know, I'm not sure. I think it's the way they used to do it, maybe some years ago before I was around. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I, I'm not saying that every week it's important that we get together and, and, or that it's a serious meeting every time. Um, but y'all are talking and... Yeah, yeah, we're talking. And, um, and uh, the food in the house is a whole lot better than it is elsewhere, but um, <clears throat> that's because Rebecca does such a good job for the members. Um, but uh, but it, it, yeah, we're off to a good start there. I really love the deeply seated institutional loyalty in the Texas legislature. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take a couple of questions. So the first question is from the audience, from uh, Jenny. Uh, and she wants to know, how will the decline in oil affect the state budget? Well, according to our breakfast partner this morning, um, Hager, um, not as much as some people are fearing. I'm not sure, I'm not sure we know yet. Um, and people I talked to from West Texas, um, some people I talked to even from South Texas and around the state in Houston, um, you know, over time may change that may change that opinion some. Uh, but there's no question our, our state's economy is more diversified than it has been in other downturns and severe downturns in oil prices. Um, gas prices have been depressed for a long period of time. Um, it will have an impact, no doubt. Um, right now it doesn't appear to be drastic, but it's certainly worth watching. And as you see these energy companies beginning to talk about significant um, backing away from capital investment and in some cases, um, you know, pretty significant layoffs. Um, that, can't, that can't be positive for our economy. Again, we need to focus on continuing to diversify our economy and even, I think, doubles down our responsibility in this legislative session to, to focus on um, economic development, to focus on, on education and creating more opportunities for people where the jobs do exist. And um, some of them may be in the oil and gas and energy world. Some of them are going to be in other, in other industries, too. So um, we're going to be fine in Texas as long as we keep our, our um, good thing going in terms of being a place that's, that's very interested in creating opportunities for people. Okay. Uh, we have a question also from the audience, from Tracy. Uh, in regards to the contracting issues at HHSC, what changes do you foresee in, con in contracting with all state agencies? So tell us a little more about what you think is coming out. Yeah, well, she wanted me to press you more. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm wondering if there really is a Tracy or whether this is just your follow-up. Tracy, I know you're here. Raise your hand. Um, <laughs> She's here. Hi, Tracy. Um, I, I know there have been a couple of proposals. I think Senator Nelson had something she put out there, um, and Chairman Otto had a, had a proposal in our in our recent budget um, or appropriations 
submissions. They were talking about it this morning in the hearing. Okay, good. And um, so, you know, tighter, tighter restrictions, more transparency, a, a diffusion of, um, of authority over making big dollar decisions and accountability. Um, so I think I, we're, gonna, we're gonna take this very, very seriously. And um, I think we're gonna have some very serious, very strong reforms uh, where this kind of thing won't, won't be allowed to happen without, without, um, without some discovery of it. So you do think that there's kind of a, there's something of a, there's a little bit of a broader problem, some tightening up just needs to be take place yeah, across I mean, it's, the it's board. Yeah, I mean, it's prevention. We need to put in place serious safeguards to prevent this kind of abuse. And it doesn't all have to be in $100 million contracts either. It makes you wonder what we don't know that might have been allowed. And um, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but we're, we're gonna address it. Yeah, best to know if you even if Yeah. Okay, another question from Nadine, also somebody here. Do you think all the conflict between the Regents and UT Austin will be resolved soon? I feel like we're making great progress there already. Yeah, I mean, I really think, I really think with um, Governor Abbott's uh, recent appointments to the Board of Regents, that was a very strong indication of the direction he wants to go, which is away from all this consternation and turmoil at UT Austin. I know I'm sitting on the campus in the middle of UT Austin here, but guess what? Higher education in Texas isn't 100% centered right here. This is an incredibly valuable institution. People love it, they're loyal to it, it's important. Um, but there's a big world outside UT Austin, and it's time that the conversation um, extend out uh, to other campuses too, not just in the UT system, but others, um, for the over a million people that are in our community colleges too. Um, but back on your, your specific point, I think that um, with Admiral McRaven coming in and providing very strong leadership at the system level, um, the appointments that have been made by Governor Abbott, I really feel very, very uh, positive about the future course of, of UT. And are, is, is there lingering business in the House, or if things were to go s smoothly from here on out, the House is pretty much done other than its normal oversight functions? In terms of the, the matter that we've been yeah. looking at, yeah. um, I think it's time to move on personally. Um, but if something comes up, if there's some sort of behavior that requires us to refocus on the actions that we've seen in the past, I think we would do so. And though I'm not speaking officially for the institution, I think I can speak for a lot of people. Like we agree that in this context, there was, we didn't need all the attention <laughs> per se. <laughs> right. Sometimes attention is not a good thing. <laughs> Okay, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, Michelle says, there are various bills relating to marijuana usage circulating in the legislature. What do you think the chances are of a medical marijuana bill passing? Well, there's more discussion about it this time than I've ever seen before. I mean, it comes up from time to time, but um, <clears throat> it seems to be um, a more serious discussion this time. I'm not predicting that a bill will pass. Uh, but I do think there will be some consideration when before it may have just been, you know, put off to the side. It's, it's, it feels to me like one of those things, it's one of those issues in the legislature that percolate slowly over time, and it does seem right. to be taking baby steps over time, and it's tracking the broader society, right? Yeah, and I think it maybe has something to do with those who are advocating for uh, certain bills, and I'm not an expert on what they're advocating in terms of the legislation. But the stories that are being told and the, and the people that are coming forward to tell them um, are real world stories of um, medical issues within people's families. Uh, it's, not, it's clearly not just some you know, fringe movement of people that are trying to backdoor into using a recreational drug. Um, again, I'm not predicting that some bill will pass. But, that, but, I, but I do think that the discussion is a lot more serious this time um, than it has been in the past. It's those discussions you think are really kind of moving it because of the medical. Yes. Thing. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty moving when you talk to a parent of a of a child who thinks that 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 um, laws are restricting the ability of a family to get help for their children. Okay, this is from Twitter, and this is from Polly Sci Lounge. Uh, this is a instructional support group, I believe. Um, it seems to me like they're asking you to answer somebody's essay question. Uh -oh. <laughs> this says, discuss the I hope it isn't for credit, because I wasn't too good at this. <laughs> discuss the length of the Texas legislative session compared to other states. What are the, the pros and cons of 
every other year of the biennial sessions in Texas. I'm a very strong advocate of the way we do it in Texas. And I do travel some, talk to other presiding officers of legislatures around the country, and they're amazed at how we, how we can do our business in a big state um, with a huge population um, and a pretty complicated state government. We can do a two-year budget. They're amazed. Um, but they're envious, too, for the most part. Um, I think the way we, we do things in Texas with a 140-day session every other year um, forces, um, forces a focus to make decisions that aren't just you know, like a quarter-to-quarter -quarter decision or to legislate based on today's headline in the newspaper. You have to make longer-term uh, commitments to programs. And um, it also gives your legislative work a little more time to see whether things are working when you come back. House Bill 5 is a good example. If we had come back the very next year, the, the bill would have barely, you know, even be um, beginning to be implemented. In fact, that's the case right now. So I think every other year is, is, is a good um, interval, and um, that's not going to change. Well, uh, allowing for the fact that it's almost certainly not going to change. Um, I mean, but you, also, it also allows people to go home yeah. and um, you know, to stay connected to their communities and not be like Washington, for example, where they're you know, in Washington, they're in D.C. for three days and, and raising money the rest of the time, and it's a perpetual merry-go-round of you know, going nowhere. I think the way we do it is, is, is good. Do you ever have even a little bit of doubt when it's about day 135 of a session and things are getting crazy and bills are dying, maybe some things you wish weren't, even a little bit maybe? That we had more time? Yeah. I've never wished for more time. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time day 135 comes around, I don't know what day it is. <laughs> right. um, none of us do. But, but it, um, you know, it, forces, it forces the, the things you have to do to get to the top of the agenda. Um, and there are a lot of, and I don't think I'm alone in saying that, um, and I think it's a pretty conservative virtue, um, that passing a budget is really the only thing we are required to do, to pass a balanced budget. And uh, all the rest of it is, um, you know, nice if you can get it done. Okay, last one. Uh, this is from Rachel Hernandez, uh, who's in the audience. You say that all these issues are important. How do you go about prioritizing what matters most and putting them in order? Well, I keep, a things, I keep things pretty simple. And, um, and in terms of the things that are important to me, they're pretty, pretty basic. Um, I also have to be a good listener and, um, and determine what's important to the House members. And that, that becomes pretty evident. And I have an enormously talented staff, too, um, who do a great job keeping their ear to the ground and working the committees and working with the members to know what um, you know, is important to them to get done. So you just you sift through it. It's consistent yeah. with what you've said before. It's the devil's in the details. Devil's in the details. And there are thousands of bills that are filed. Um, you got to rely on good committee chairmen, too, to organize their business. It isn't a, it isn't a top-down <coughs> structure in the House. Maybe on a few issues that I think are fundamentally important, I'll be pretty engaged in. Um, but the House members take care of their own business and their committees and, and on the floor. So would you say that those issues that you're fundamentally engaged in are the ones that you started with when I asked you? Yes. Transportation, education, some aspects of the budget? Water, yeah. The Water. things that are, that are fundamentally important to, to the increased opportunity for generations of Texans in the future. I think that's a good place to stop. Thanks very much for coming, Speaker. We you know bet. you're very busy. Thank it's you. Good to be with to have you. you back. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All. Thank you. All right. Thank all of you for watching. We'll be uh, posting this video on the internet just as soon as we can get it ready. Um, I'm not going to stress out our video staff by promising an exact time, but it will be soon. Uh, find us at the Texas Politics Project, texaspolitics.utexas.edu. Um, and thanks for joining us, and have a great evening.